Um, and uh, it gives me really great pleasure to introduce Ashish Rajadhyaksha, our speaker for today. Ashish is from the Center for the Study of Culture and Society in Bangalore, India. Um, and for those of you who sort of have any intersections with film and media studies, Ashish needs no introduction in some ways. Um, his uh, previous books, particularly the Encyclopedia of Indian Cinema, which he did with Paul Willeman, is sort of a, uh, I'm not sure how many PhD dissertations and other books it sort of uh, sparked. Um, and he followed that up with several other articles, really wonderful pieces in this journal called the Journal of Arts and Ideas. Um, defunct probably now, right? but uh, still very much available online and also in different sites. Um, he's also written another very recent book. It's a two-volume series. The second volume, I'm told, is on its way. The first one is called Indian Cinema in the Time of Celluloid, From Bollywood to the Emergency. And it's one of the most sort of comprehensive takes on why we're why Bombay cinema has become something that we've decided is Bollywood. Uh, and it provides a sort of very grounded sort of historical take on the transformations in Bombay. And also the last cultural mile, an inquiry into technology and governance in India. And what he's going to present today is something that's really timely, interesting, uh, and something that uh, all of us should really be interested in hearing about the identity project that the Indian government has been embarking on in collaboration with a number of other partners, including most prominently Infosys. So, uh, and Ashish is going to present from what's called the Identity Project, a massive collaborative project that he's just wrapped up. And the EPUB of the project should be out very soon, and he'll tell us a little bit more about it. So please join me in welcoming Ashish Rajadeksha. Thanks, Ashwin. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Farina, who first wrote to me, and uh, others uh, for, for, for having me here. Uh, this is, uh, can I just ask a quick show of hands? How many of you know about Aadhaar? Have you heard of it? Everyone has. Uh, this is, so it's, it's probably something you all heard about. Um, you may have heard a few things about it that probably aren't true, uh, or misrepresentations about it, which are very, very common. Uh, or you may have an idea about it, which often sort of uh, uh, fits into different kinds of positions uh, about Aadhaar. Uh, very quickly about the project we did, uh, as uh, Ashwin read out my CV, it would be probably quite clear that I have not the kind of person who would ordinarily be doing a project like this. I come from film studies, uh, and I, 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 that's an area of my, that's my comfort zone. That's where I basically do most of my work. Uh, but I do think that in some sense, the further move of what used to be the cinema, if you like, in, in, a, in, in what we're now calling the digital ecosystem, constitutes a peculiar continuity of some of those concerns, because it does seem as though the digital environment uh, within which India is now entering uh, does have certain precedent um, legacies that are that are produced by some of these media. Uh, so that in some ways qualifies me, if you like, at one level to want to take what used to be the cinema debate forward into uh, digital platforms of uh, of governance. Cinema and governance itself has been something that many people have worked on, and this in some sense continues that. But it is, of course, a great deal more. Part of the problem that we had with the Aadhaar initiative, which uh, of course is very famous uh, as being probably one of the world's largest digital initiatives of its kind, uh, uh, very quickly it is an, it's, it's an effort to create a unique identity number not card, importantly, a number for every Indian resident. Resident, not citizen. Anybody who lives in India, regardless of his or her nationality, is entitled to receive an Aadhaar number. Okay? This initiative began in uh, February of 2009, and our project began a year later, partly because, maybe substantially because, we were deeply dissatisfied with the nature of the debate that Aadhaar was generating in, in India, and not only in India. It seemed to us that there were two extreme positions that it was generating. The first, a condition of uh, what I might call techno-utopia, a sort of an assumption that somehow or the other, this problem was going to be one single point solution to the problems in our country. And this, there have been many, many uh, excessive techno-utopian sort of claims that have been made about this. Uh, and the other, it's opposite a kind of techno-dystopia, you might say. 
a condition that this was Big Brother state, this was Orwellian state, this was going to be a way by which uh, basic rights including the right to privacy, would be taken away by a surveillance mechanism that would be larger than anything we've seen before. Our project emerged out of, as I was saying, a dissatisfaction with both positions. But at the same time, it did not seem to us self-evident as to what the issues with Aadhaar were. What were, the, what were the key issues, if you like, that Aadhaar now raised, which could become the debates of the social sciences. As, as they went on. The technologists had their own set of debates, but social sciences, it seemed, did not necessarily know quite how to tackle this particular problem. And it seemed very often in, that in the absence of the kind of, you might say, the digits or the kind of um, issues that Aadhaar would raise, it seemed as though a 21st century phenomenon was often being critiqued with 20th century ideas. For instance, uh, the right to privacy. Uh, there is clearly a set of issues in the right to privacy, but the concept of privacy that was often seen to be in danger seemed to be a peculiarly archaic and older definition of privacy, not necessarily connected to the kinds of issues around, say, data protection or data retention that the 21st century was throwing up. So we needed a set of, if you like, issues that we wanted to tag on to, uh, which we wanted to discuss. The project itself has gone on for close to three years. It has just come to an end as on 31st of March. Um, it was supported by the Ford Foundation. And under this project, what we did was that we did a huge amount of actual field work in seven Indian states. Uh, these Indian states being starting from the east, Tripura, Jharkhand, uh, the Himachal Pradesh, Delhi, uh, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, and Kerala. In these states, we went to a number of districts which had initiated Aadhaar, but we didn't restrict our analysis only to Aadhaar. Right? We were very interested in what else was going on in terms of digitization. And we've done an enormous amount of field research, uh, much of which has been captured deliberately on amateur video and is now available, not all of it, but 100 of our key interviews are up on, on, on the public domain in something called cscs.pad.ma, uh, available for anybody to look at. And uh, these constitute interviews that we have with uh, enrollees, we have, for example, a lot of interviews with local level bureaucracy like panchayat uh, officials or district level officials. We have a number of interviews with uh, operators who did the other enrollment and a number of other people like what they call in India now village level entrepreneurs, VLEs, which are basically a species of entrepreneur who often who offers what are known as common service centers initiatives, you know, including the capacity to pay your electricity bills online, the capacity to make various kinds of payments online, which actually vary. I'll come to BLEs a little bit later. We have interviews with a number of such people, local, local entrepreneurs, if you like. Um, and all, all of this is online, and we are putting together, and we have just put together, it's actually in its final stage of design, a book. It's called The Digital Ecosystem. Um, and the idea in this is to sort of explore what we now see, uh, and this is, I think, the main point I want to begin this presentation with, as nothing less than the public sphere of the 21st century in India. It is, it is, it is the public sphere of the 21st century in the fullest sense of the term. It does seem to us, when we look at the, the scale of the kind of initiatives Aadhaar is putting in place, that the overdetermined, for example, nature of social networking media as influencing democracy, something that's been hugely debated, may be inadequate uh, to understanding a phenomenon such as this. We're looking at a situation when people who literally are digitally illiterate are becoming what has come to be known as digital natives, uh, denizens of a digital ecosystem, people whose rights, their livelihoods are dependent on how they can or cannot navigate a digital structure, and this particular digital ecosystem now for more and more people in India across the social spectrum are people whose rights, including, for example, their rights to access to land, rights of access to credit, and various other kinds of rights are dependent on becoming digital subjects in the full sense of the term. And one question that we had was a simple one of, were people comfortable doing this? Were people aware of what it meant to be a digital native? Uh, let me start this with a quick little clip. This is, uh, as I say, amateur video. But this is a woman in Jharkhand being enrolled for Aadhaar. <laughs> 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 
Hindi speaking people hopefully will be able to get on get, get it better, but it should be self evident. It's a tribal woman being enrolled for Aadhaar. Look at the red light, stand still, don't move, get your eyes in place. Um, the other system is basically to get both, bio, both iris scans and 10 biometrics on, uh, 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 as part of the record. And we have this totally bewildered tribal woman in Jharkhand being now uh, enrolled. Um, Approximately 200 million people in India have already been enrolled in this particular way, uh, which is approximately um, sort of one-fifth of the total Indian population. In many ways, um, the idea of, a, of an Aadhaar ecosystem um, emerges in 2006 uh, into th when we have in something called the National E-Governance Program, the NEGP, which now looks at something like 30-odd mission mode projects, which are now supposed to make digital delivery of services available. Uh, these are basically to do with e-banking, excise and customs, income tax, insurance, passports, pensions, uh, including the payment of commercial tax, the recording of land records, municipal records, and gram panchayats. Um, it is actually one a, a set of a rather complex sort of structure of digital uh, delivery that they have put in place. Our project, uh, when we look at Aadhaar, uh, has been to understand not Aadhaar itself, but really this, this overall ecosystem, as I was saying. And one mistake that I think we often make um, is when we look at Aadhaar as an overdetermined presence within this ecosystem, is, is its role within that ecosystem, if you like. Um, we have found increasingly that because Aadhaar is a cog in a rather giant wheel, or you might rather more specifically say a cog within a series of giant wheels, which it gets to talk to each other, it's known as interoperability. In other words, massive databases that exist autonomously from each other, which are increasingly able to, to coalesce, to create a diverse set of informations about a single individual because that person becomes what has come to be known in Indian bureaucracy as a connector, a particular person to whom different databases can talk to each other or over whom they can talk to each other. That because Aadhaar is the only cog in the set of wheels that has taken upon itself to imagine the wheel, we have often in India mistaken the cog for the wheel. The wheel is much larger and the cog is a small part of that wheel. Um, in this particular instance, we have a situation when an initiative that does precisely two things, and not a third, uh, has taken upon itself the responsibility of defining the set of uses to which it might be put. As I said earlier, what Aadhaar does is A, gives a unique number, and B, deduplicates that particular number. These are the two things that it does. So every, in, every resident will get a number, and B, wherever necessary, that system will establish the fact that the person is who he or she claims to be. So if, as happened, almost happened this morning, if I could have turned up at Chicago airport or Bombay equivalent of it and said I am so and so and I had no papers to prove it, technically I could actually go for a biometric check and Aadhaar would say yes, this is the person. This is the same person and that is all that is said that they are going to actually do. They said a number of further things, they said a number of additional things which are actually what have been illuminating and also I think confusing. 
Um, one of the things that happened was that they said that because it's only for it's it's for residents and not only only for citizens, and B that it is not mandatory, you had a situation where Aadhaar, which has no purpose of its own, it has no use of its own, but only has a use to the extent that some service puts it to use. You know, so for example, a public distribution system will say, okay, we will now use Aadhaar to get our service delivery structures in place, or uh, a bank will say, for example, that well, we will put all Aadhaar numbers on our credit cards, or pension schemes will say, well, we will use Aadhaar to be able to identify the beneficiaries better, or direct cash transfer, and so on. You had a situation in which different and potentially conflicting um, uh, projects used Aadhaar for different and sometimes conflicting reasons. Right? So this was actually one of the set of problems that arose, uh, and why I also said in the beginning that maybe you may have heard wrong about Aadhaar, because often Aadhaar has become a bit of a chimera, it's become like, like Chinese whispers. There are too many different people who claim too many different things for Aadhaar, and that's one of the problems that I want to, want to talk about. A second problem, apart from the diversity of users to which Aadhaar is being put in this country, is the extraordinary diversity of users is being put in different locations in the country. This is crucial for our understanding. It is that in different places in the country, the use of this idea of a digital ecosystem means fundamentally different things. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is requiring us, it seems to me, that to, to, to imagine a situation where in contrast to, uh, you might say, a hyper-rational, fully computer-driven, database-driven uh, ecosystem in which everything, if you like, makes kind of rational sense, which is one imagination that it has, it's precisely likely to be a, an organic structure opening up in very local contexts and increasingly you might actually have conflicts and clashes over how it uh, defines the idea of a, of a subject. So uh, you might actually have uh, something that we should talk about later, a kind of a vernacular digital ecosystem, a digital vernacular, uh, which, is, which, is, which is not precisely the centralized kind of structure, leading to a number of questions, which I want to talk about very briefly later, for the Indian state is presently constituted to take on board. And it may well be that the, you know, the, the, the immovable object of the Indian state is meeting the irresistible force of a digital ecosystem so that one of the two has to give. You know, there has to be a set of problems that could, that could potentially arise. There have been uh, different kinds of uses to which Aadhaar has been imagined. And I think fundamental ideological uh, conflicts, if you like, that have arisen in terms of the imagination that it has it, it, it is being put, uh, to which it is being put. Um, it's, of course, key uh, protagonist is, is, is Nandan Nilekani. By the way, there is no direct connection with Infosys. Uh, Nilekani was one of India's IT czars. We, the name is known, very well known. Uh, but he left Infosys in order to take on the UIDAI. And officially, there is no connection between uh, the, the UIDAI and, 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 and Infosys. But at the same time, he has an argument for what he thinks Aadhaar should do, which those of you who have read his um, best-selling book, Imagining India, may have maybe already familiar with. He speaks of a groundswell. He speaks of a certain kind of what he says, a force surging up from the grassroots, a kind of an entrepreneurial initiative that has arisen uh, when uh, different sorts of niche enterprises in India, uh, from small-scale microfinance to uh, the famous argument in India, small sachets, you know, the one rupee sachets of shampoos that are being sold, a whole series of low-end businesses that have seen an opportunity, which opportunity has gone alongside information technology to make these opportunities happen. So this is an idea that he has of a diversity, if you like, of you of players in that particular structure. Um, the idea of technology as something that the state would now use to, 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 you know, to use, again, the famous Indian phrase, leapfrog over a, a historical divide is not in itself new, which leads us to the question as to how new, how unprecedented is the, is the, is the digital challenge that India is up against right now? How completely uh, unexpected, if you like, the problems that we're faced up to. In fact, one of the pioneers of the sort of thinking that Nilekani um, 
embodies today was a, a very well-known Indian scientist called Vikram Sarabhai, who uh, at that point of time in the late 1960s was the father of the space program in India, but also the satellite program, which saw the growth of first telecommunications and then television in India. Uh, at that point of time, back in 1969, Vikram Sarabhai had suggested that the two problems that India had were geographical distance, excessively large distances, and linguistic diversity, too many languages. And he said that television would, in one fell swoop, as it were, as a, as a historical leapfrogging, uh, overcome these problems almost overnight. Um, the idea of the Indian state taking the latest available technology in order to overcome historical lacunae is therefore not new. But there is something new that Nilekani is doing, and that in itself is extremely interesting. And that is that in the Sarabhai imagination, you still had a particular sort of state structure. You had a centralized state, which was the sender if you like, of benefit and a sender of messages, and you had a recipient. The sender was always in sitting in Delhi or in the centers of power, and the recipient was always in, you know, in the far, whatever you call it, you know, the, 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 the far extremes of the country. You know, someone who, uh, I think as Nilikani in one particular place puts it, um, was, uh, I can't find that, uh, um, someone who, you know, uh, uh, someone who lived in distant villages, dirt roads, miles away from the nearest market. This was the recipient. Okay, and the problem at that point of time was how did the sender send and the recipient receive in a manner that would allow the state to function better. There is a fundamental change to that model because what's now happening is that in the process of receiving as IT takes over, the recipient is no longer merely a recipient, but also a sender. The recipient now has become a sender of information. Okay? So as the recipient receives, the recipient in the process of receiving generates data about him or herself, which data, if you like, goes from the village back into the center and starts being collated. So you have another set of structures that are arising. This a problem which has been sometimes called in India the last mile problem um, typically means that the problem that we've had in the country is that um, the sender very often sends and the, the recipient, if you like, is either not able to receive or there is some kind of a, 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 a problem at the doorstep of delivery. Uh, as it were, that, that makes it very hard for the recipient to, 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 to receive. But when the receiver also becomes a sender, you start having peer-to-peer -peer mechanisms which fundamentally transform the centralized state structure. Okay? Now, this has been a, a question that has arisen, and I already mentioned earlier the kind of organic nature of databases that are arising, which have led to many, many complex questions coming up, for example, when Aadhaar sets up. As I said earlier, what Aadhaar is doing is they are... Uh, taking on responsibilities considerably in excess of what they are minimally supposed to do. Uh, and they have been setting up digital ecosystems almost from scratch, where these have not existed in different parts of India. But importantly, and this is really the crucial point, they have been integrating themselves with pre-existing databases whenever such databases have existed. And this leads us to the question as to what then is the prehistory before the National E-Governance Program of Digital Ecosystems. And you end up with some very curious facts. You end up with a situation where, for example, uh, Tripura or Himachal Pradesh or Jharkhand have a, or Kerala have a considerably longer history of digitization than supposedly the most famous state in India that's supposed to deal with digi digitization, Karnataka. You, you end up with a situation where the standard indices of development go completely askew. And you have, for example, states that are not doing well within uh, an earlier you know, economic set of developmental indicators actually becoming very much more developed, like Bihar, for example, when you're looking at the, the, the sort of digital structure. Now, I want to sort of, for the rest of my presentation, uh, identify uh, what, what I believe we have uh, identified six key problems. Uh, as I was saying earlier, I thought that the kind of problems we had about privacy or around, you know, uh, a kind of a rampant 
you know, uh, big brother state, if you like, were not satisfactory to us because it did not seem as though these were this, as though the reality was going to pan out quite in this particular way. And so we decided we were going to try and see what were the issues and the six issues that I want to talk about, which is the the bulk of my presentation, um, uh, are, are, are these. A few other, a couple of other uh, prefatory statements. One, um, the increasing use of the term resident as against citizen. Indeed, I am increasingly suspecting that the word citizen is going out of India's political vocabulary. The word citizen is being replaced with the word resident and a third word of tremendous significance, beneficiary. The beneficiary is becoming the word that everyone is now using. Citizen, resident, beneficiary is a set of terms that I want to want to uh, talk about as 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 important so um, stress point number one top down state top down state versus lateral market driven benefit fundamental divisions in India over this particular crisis um, one of the problems that has arisen in India uh, has been the the um, uh, ideological difference, um, some may say, between um, a key imagination that Aadhaar had that it would have multiple points of entry into the digital ecosystem where any uh, citizen, if you like, would be able to enter a, a digitized structure and get his Aadhaar number from a number of registrars. So it is up to you. You know, it could be a bank who'll do it for you. It could be, I don't know, the university that you work in that could give you an Aadhaar number as part of providing your employment benefits. It could be a way by which you could get an Aadhaar number as part of enrollment in a, in, a, in a university or in a school. It could be a set of structures as against the idea that there would be a single point of entry, uh, which is the kind of ideology that is very often attached to India's, at that time, home minister, and today it's finance minister, a man called P. Chidambaram, who has been accused primarily of, of, of uh, uh, leading the centralized state sort of structure as against multiple points of entry structure that Nilekani represents. This is a set of, a set of problems for which we don't have an answer as of now. The related set of problems for which we do not have an answer is our markets and, and Nilekani's ideology is fundamentally market friendly and, and assumes that public benefit can be delivered through market mechanisms. Uh, is an ideological issue that has arisen. And for example, Amartya Sen, a uh, very well-known figure, I'm sure, here, um, has taken a rather ambig ambivalent position on this, where he says, I quote him, the role that markets play must depend not only on what they can do, but also on what they are allowed to do. There are many people whose interests are well served by the smooth functioning of markets, but there are also groups whose established interests may be hurt by such functioning. If the latter groups are politically more powerful and influential, then they can try and see that they're, that, uh, they're not given any adequate room in the economy. Confronting such influences has to occur not merely through resisting or exposing the seekers of profit from captive markets, but also from taking on, as he says, that intellectual arguments as proper subjects of scrutiny. Elsewhere, Sen says that if I, in making a public service available to you, have a personal benefit in doing so, then is that service a public service? You know, if there is a profit motive or if there is a more, you know, uh, a, a covert sort of, uh, um, you know, interest that I may have in making a public service available, then it certainly skews the idea of what a public service is. And there are further issues that might arise in this, in this area. So that is particular stress point one, top down versus lateral movements. As I say, uh, the last word on this particular subject has certainly not been. And I, I imagine, uh, and this project proposes, that this is an area on which we will probably have an enormous amount of debate and con con confrontation. The second, I've already mentioned briefly, citizen versus beneficiary. Um, one of the problems that arises, and we basically what happened was that when we um, began this project, we began it as almost a clean slate structure. But we, um, after we did a first round of field research across these states, we focused on three kinds of beneficiaries that we wanted to pay most attention to. The first is a very curious beneficiary. He or she is the homeless in Delhi. 
the homeless, the category of homelessness was something that we were interested in. Delhi particularly has a rather articulate definition of, of, of homelessness, and I will come to that now. I'll show you a small um, documentary about, about homelessness uh, in Delhi, which uh, we made. Your card will come after four months. Have you got the photograph taken? And everyone will, you know, get it. We'll get it after four months. This is a, a homeless shelter. The, um, they have a locker system. They charge three rupees per night for the locker. And for four, 15 rupees, you can get food. Um, basically, uh, I just want to mention this, that uh, one of the problems that there are two or three problems that the homeless have in Delhi. One is that they're not necessarily poor, not necessarily uh, the kind of uh, categories that we often attach to the homeless. There are very many complex reasons of why they are homeless in Delhi. Um, the second is that typically the problem that they have when they come to these shelters uh, at the end of the day, often uh, in the biting cold, uh, slightly drunk um, or otherwise intoxicated, um, the main problem is how do they keep their money for the night and how do they make sure they're not robbed when they sleep. So uh, one of the things that happens here is that with a biometric, you can actually get a, a little locker for a certain amount of money. Uh, there have been NGO groups actually that have been working with World Bank support that for a thousand rupees will offer them some kind of shelter, uh, including you know food and uh, and you know the, a, a place to bathe in and uh, toilet facilities and maybe even um, a cafeteria for as little as a thousand rupees a month. Um, the problem that we have here is this: the problem is what Amartya Sen calls the relationship of stigma that's attached to becoming a digital beneficiary. The difficulty of, in this instance, being a beneficiary as against a citizen means that you will receive this particular benefit if you get Aadhaar, and therefore you are targeted as this 
kind of beneficiary. So a homeless person in Delhi, and this is the problem that we have with them, uh, that they have often with this, is that they are named officially as the homeless. They have no other way of defining themselves if, if they're going to get state benefit. This has been, for example, a problem with refugees. Uh, we have, for example, migrants, um, particularly northeast of India, who are refugees, who have to make a considered choice of whether they want Aadhaar or do not want Aadhaar, because they have to figure out what it means to be listed as a refugee. Uh, this problem, when you are actually attached to a particular benefit, when a database actually links you to a benefit, sometimes to which is attached maybe a stigma, has been one of the problems of taking the idea of citizenship away and, and, and putting the idea of beneficiary in, 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 in as something that replaces it. This has been, I think, a major debate in India, partly because citizenship is something that we are very strong about in India. And, and, and to replace it as beneficiary does do things to um, that particular figure. Stress point three, voluntary versus, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. The, uh, just as a quick background, um, uh, I want to get all this done, so we should get this question. But, but no, no very, but very quickly in answer to your question, uh, sometime in 2006 or 2007, uh, the government of Delhi put together what they call the Mission Convergence Project, where they identified, I think, 5.5 lakh um, combination of slum dwellers and homeless. Uh, and beggars. This problem had arisen pri primarily because in the context of things like the, the Commonwealth Games, when a lot of the so-called beggars were literally forcibly evicted from, from the city of Delhi, you had a, a database that defined them as such. Now, because the homeless was a special subcategory of this who did not have an address, which address was a mandatory requirement to get Aadhaar, you had a structure called the Homeless Resource Centers, uh, which were all over Delhi, which address they could give. So the homeless resource center was the address that they could give when they didn't have one of their own. And then there was a particular structure with the, the smart card that the, the mission convergence, sorry, the mother NGO, which this woman Smriti in the beginning speaks for, uh, actually, curiously enough, linked where they lived, not where they had a home, to the Aisha map of Delhi, saying that you know this particular number was on this particular page, this particular one, this particular column, suggesting that this particular man living under this bus shelter, for example, was was a, a, what can I say, an authorized homeless, you know, a registered homeless. Uh, this was then, if you like, the problem. My third stress point is voluntary versus compulsory enrollment, a big issue in, in, in India. Is getting an Aadhaar card voluntary or is it compulsory? Um, Aadhaar itself says it's voluntary. It says you do not have to get one if you do not need to get, if you do not want to get one. Um, a number of schemes attached to Aadhaar, however, do make it mandatory. In other words, as George Dress says, that if uh, you will not get rations, if you do not have Aadhaar, what kind of choice is it to say it's not mandatory? You know, This, said George Dress, is like, I quote him verbatim, is like um, selling them drinking water after you've poisoned the village well. Uh, you know, <laughs> there is no choice. You, you're forcing them into a certain condition, and 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 then you're saying that they, it's 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 not mandatory. At the same time, I think I do want to make a distinction between mandatory and non-mandatory. It seems to me that a distinction needs to be made between again a Chidambaram sort of ideology in which, as per the National Population Register, you are legally liable if you do not register under the NPR, and B, more importantly, if, if any member of a household misrepresents the truth, then the head of the household is, is, is legally liable for that misrepresentation. Seems to be very different from, uh, you might say, a self-enabling condition. At the bottom, in terms of mandatory or non-mandatory, is not so much is it legally required or not legally required, but do you consider enrollment a condition of enablement a condition of choice in which you will decide what sort of an ecosystem you want to enter and what the benefit it has to you, or is it something that's assigned to you by the state? This choice is a very, very crucial choice, and I think it's very often getting lost. It's something that we believe in the interviews that we have conducted is a very real fact 
that, that arises again and again in terms of are you assigned this or are you choosing to be there? In other words, do you have an idea of self-interest that permits you to be there or are you required to be there because the state says so? Um, this problem has particularly arisen when biometrics have been mounted on several data resources that work with um, what Partha Chatterjee once called via Foucault the populational purpose of uh, citizenship. Partha Chatterjee's very famous book, uh, essay actually called uh, Beyond the State of Within, spoke about a way by which India had been able, without necessarily giving people full-scale citizenship rights, had been able to work out an enumerative mechanism whereby it could identify people and give them certain rights without necessarily giving them full citizenship structures. You know, you, you, you could, for example, vote. You could, for example, uh, avail of electricity without necessarily, for example, owning the kind of uh, rights that citizens, full citizens, you might have, you might consider them to, 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 to have. Um, I move to um, stress point four, which is a problem that arises primarily in the public distribution system in India. Universal versus targeted benefit. Again, something that goes back to the, the founding principles of India. Can you create segregated definitions of population uh, and give them different sorts of benefit? Or are you required by the very nature of our constitution to make sure that all people in India have the same rights? The problem in, in this particular universal, universal versus targeted arose in the context of the public distribution system that we have in India, which is the one thing, apart from the employment guarantee scheme, that is supposed to use Aadhaar, for which Aadhaar is, if you like, primarily devised, you know, the, the PDS structure. A very quick little history of PDS, the public distribution system, which was originally called the ration card system, the rationing system, had arisen in India for the very first time during the Second World War. As a result of the fact that it had arisen as a wartime measure, as a special case situation, after the war, PDS was abolished. But it was reintroduced very quickly after the war was over in 1950, primarily to overcome food scarcity that was very serious at that point of time. In 1965, we had the Food Corporation of India and the Agricultural Prices Commission. And in 1970, it was made universal. In 1997, the universality of the food structure was taken away, and you had what was then known as segregated um, 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 rationing structures when you came out with a new category called the below poverty line or the BPL, and you had a different kind of ration card that went to someone who was BPL as against to someone who was not BPL. This led to a number of problems, and those problems have even now not been solved. It led primarily to ethical problems. Should India divide up its population in this way? Is it, in principle, something that India should do? Two, it led to the practical question, who is poor? How do you define poverty? Uh, this, was, this has been a controversy in India, and we actually had a really large controversy not too long ago when the Planning Commission decided that anybody who earned a daily wage of less than, I think, 26 rupees? 26 rupees. Sorry. Something like that, 26 rupees, which is about, what, 40p, 40 pence, 40 cents? I forgot the country I'm in. Uh, per day. Um, <laughs> Uh, was was below poverty line, and then you know this led to, of course, the question of what 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 do you think you're talking about? If someone's earning this kind of money, you know, you're losing out on a huge number of people who are actually very poor and are not getting the benefits of poverty, of of, of the poverty alleviation programs. Um, and the third, which was the only one out of the three which has made sense to the Indian state. The first two are areas on which the Indian state in the end has no opinion. Although the food security bill is on the way and should have been passed if parliament in India were functioning, which it is not right now, is the question of leakage prevention. Now this has got a history of its own. We have had a number of states in India, and Andhra Pradesh, which is a state that we've done a lot of work in, is one such, where for all practical purposes they have abandoned the idea of segregated rationing. 
in 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 andhra pradesh uh, they have gone in for what they call the saturation model in which they have said that since they are not permitted by the government of india to name everybody as a beneficiary they will all for all practical purposes assume that the entire or almost the entire population of that state is below poverty line so everybody gets a bpl card regardless of what their income is leading to of course a huge number of scandals when people who are clearly very rich are making uh, are having benefits that are bpl benefits now this is this is uh, a major problem um in 19 in the early 1980s when nt rama rao in the uh, state of andhra pradesh had won his major election on the populist 2 rupees rice scheme it was basically to make rice available to people at the rate of 2 rupees per kilo uh, they had issued ration cards which had at that, at a point of time in certain districts apparently the controversy was that there were more ration cards given than the population of that place so they were they were you know fairly indiscriminately giving ration cards out and this led to a set of problems around what came to be known as ghost identities or identities uh, that is the cards given to people who are not non existent either that or b uh, people who had two or three ration cards in a single person's name now it is not the case that anyone may can can make that ghost identity card should not be weeded out but the problem that we have in india is that the process of emphasizing the sole use of aadhar as being that of weeding out often tends to take away from the other larger questions on universal versus targeted or on how do you define a beneficiary okay these questions we have absolutely no answers to in india and that then is my stress point number 4 two more and i'm done stress point 5 is actually extremely interesting and significant anonymized data versus targeted data um the problem uh, can be most obviously evidenced in the uh, most recent census doing something that no previous census had done and that is to take data about people's caste now caste has been one of the big controversies in india and india's official position is that while we recognize that there is caste uh, and 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 caste exists in 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 the country india officially will not admit to uh, any any um, state activity that works with discriminating with caste but they've had over the years a growing uh, number of uh, positive discrimination measures which basically uh, have been seen by the critics of uh, that particular set of initiatives to target to to benefit what came to, came to be known as the obc or the other backward caste communities which often are also known as the creamy layer in india the, the a particular form of backward caste elite uh, you might say uh, who who become the particular beneficiaries of this now uh, there is of course then the more substantive issue but then there was the procedural issue of putting obc data on uh the census and additionally of via the national population register making the census further linked to um um to biometric uh information so this was this was a a controversial area um one of the major critics of this pratabhanu mehta claimed that such a census would condemn us to the tyranny of compulsory entities also some an issue that had arisen with the homeless that a homeless would be now and forever a homeless the moment he or she would be registered as the homeless if you like uh tyranny of compulsory identity so that we could from now on never escape caste our identities he said are not something that we can choose they are given to us as non negotiable facts which we can never escape the state has legitimized the principle that we shall always be our caste and nothing else is there not a deeper indignity he says than being inflicted on those on to whom emancipation is being promised you will be your caste no matter what that is the the negative position but there have been actually a huge number of positive pro uh you know um uh cast people you might say who have argued for the 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 uh, state actually putting together material on cast as part of their their census but even those people who have been arguing for cast census have been arguing against the use of biometrics for cast and this is on a very very crucial issue and that is that 
when India in 1946 came out with the the uh, Census Act, it explicitly said that census data would not be made available across the board to, to people outside of planners, as it were. It would be confidential data. On the other hand, the National Population Register, which is, constitutes an amendment to the census rules, and many argue that this is not entirely legal, actually looks for using uh, NPR as part of an interoperable mechanism that includes what Chidambaram calls mm -hmm. the NCTC. It's called the National Counterterrorism Center, the NCTC, which is, and, and this other thing called the CCTN is the Crime and Criminals Tracking Network structure, and other kinds of databases of this kind, which the NPR will be a part of. Which means that now you have a situation where someone's caste will become public information. This could be potentially capable of being public information or could be linked to other sorts of uh, databases that will define your caste. So uh, the whole question of anonymized data versus targeted data would be uh, a question that, uh, that, that, that would arise. Um, there have been subsequent debates on what sort of database we can come up with uh, that would potentially work out the problems of caste as aspirational as against caste that is given. I mean, for example, it is well known in India that caste is a sliding category. Based on who is asking the question, I will tell you what my caste is. If my daughter is to get married, and you know, and I'm trying to set up some sort of an alliance for her with somebody. I will say I'm from a certain caste. If the government asks me uh, what my caste is, if I want to get my son uh, uh, admission to college, then I will say my caste is something else. There are it's 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 a complicated set of circumstances. And these are not entirely in, incorrect. It's just that we're looking at an ambiguous structure, and the question that arises is basically this. Are databases capable of accommodating ambiguity? Okay, this has been the question that has arisen because you're looking at a situation where you can't say either this or not this. You know, what about a gray area sort of mechanism that that that's potentially arising? Um, there have been a lot of debates on what kind of caste databases could emerge, especially because castes often are in huge numbers. I mean, you probably have. I mean, Sonali Desai suggests in any. District, for example, in India, you could have uh, a number of castes going up to more than 100, uh, which means, of course, the enumerator who comes and knocks at your door and says, what caste are you? Show me where your caste is in this particular list, could have a hell of a series of problems. But then there were potential solutions to that particular problem. Um, for all practical purposes, the entire debate has been kept aside. And uh, as of now, the Census of India 2011 basically simply says, uh, it says religion, I have the thing here. It says, uh, religion, write name of religion in full. Also give code in box if found in list below. And caste, it says, schedule caste, SC, schedule tribe, ST. Is this person SC, SC? If yes, give from the code below. If SC, ST, write name of SC or ST from the list supplied. And if not, you are OBC, or if not, of course, you're you know, not part of that, that structure. So the entire ca caste debate has either has both been sort of left at this particular level, which is the standard level at which it, it works. And so neither has it taken on the kind of people who, the, the demands of those who are arguing for a caste census in the proper sense, nor has it handled the concerns that they have of attaching these to, um, to um, a, a, a biometric mechanism. My last uh, question is to do with the privacy question. Data protection, how do I access and correct data about me? And, and this is my, my last clip I want to show. Uh, this is a rather chilling, uh, as it turned out, interview that we had with the chief executive officer of one of India's largest health insurance programs. It's called the Arogya Shri program in the state of Andhra Pradesh. And that particular program makes um, health insurance available to a very large proportion of that particular state uh, through a rather complicated set of negotiations with a single insurance agency where they're able to negotiate. Uh, and they claim that they can get for something like 450 rupees per month as insurance premium, uh, uh, sorry, 450 rupees per year, insurance premium per year, they can get a 2 lakh rupee cover for a huge proportion of the population. This is an interview with Mr. A. Babu. He is just talking about one case he has.
social economic parameters of the JSC is there. The 16 digit unique number of the health card or the white card. I told you, no? That is there. And, uh, you know, yeah. Now here, this, uh, this data, you see this two digits of family. This guy is lying down now. This photo, from where it came, you know? This photo came from the 18 million data. That is in the car. Now we are clearly establishing the identity here. Now if this doesn't come out, that fellow is not covered up. That is the meaning of it. Now we analyze this, we verify that the person has come. And all his details, his registration details, his previous treatment details, all are available. And his referral route, how he came to the hospital, his admission notes. That is all that you see in the hospital management system. His admission notes, his clinical notes. I mean, why the reorganization details? Now, this deals with the doctor and the treatment plan and other things. You can see the doctor's name is there. His qualification, his MCA registration number is there. His telephone number is there. We are giving all these things to fix the responsibility and our doctor will speak to the doctor also if we have any doubt. He will give the approval. And, and all his clinical parameters are there. His package is there. Uh, you know, in this case, we have a previous case also done. Yeah, for example, yeah. Just look at the amount of health information that's available at the man's fingertips of an arbitrary patient he's picked out. Now, here you can see the, uh, the, the, the previous existing and this EMR, all the EMRs are available here. That is electronic medical record. You know, all kinds of reports. No close This is a no close Now, we also have, you know, angiograms like this coming into us. All these things, x-rays, angiograms, blood analysis reports, color dopplers, everything brought to us online. And our end, doctors look at it. Now if it is an angiogram, it will look by a cardiologist surgeon or a cardiologist at our end. We see where the indications are there towards treatment for this patient. We establish it, we give approval. So no, nobody can cheat us in terms of unindicated procedures or other things. There's been a number of uh, concerns uh, around uh, privacy, uh, and it seems that there are a number of, you might say, innovative uh, measures that uh, that uh, uh, have been have been proposed. Um, we ourselves, when we actually went to uh, these other uh, center um, enrollment centers, found that the data was available in at least three places, as it had to be. And indeed, the fact of the matter is that if you are having multiple enrollers uh, and, and multiple registrars, as I think we concluded you should have because of the, you might say, enabling nature of it and the capacity that people have to entering it in a, in a way that's, that's, that's suitable to them or might be most, most appropriate, if you like, from their own point of view to their self-interest, uh, you are inevitably forced to actually share this data across a number of agencies. So it seems to be incompatible. The idea of secrecy or privacy seems to be incompatible with this model. So there is a set of problems that that do arise there, and and we we saw this. Um, one of the leading authorities on privacy law in this country, uh, in in India, uh, a man called Rahul Mathan, a lawyer who has been actually advising the Aadhaar uh, um, program on create on 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 their position on privacy, makes a rather curious argument for India. Um, he says that for the past decade, India's governments have been con collecting vast amounts of data about its residents. Even though we are dealing with numbers far in excess of anything that the Western world has had to handle, we in India apparently have faced none of the personal privacy challenges that people in the West seem to suffer. For him, the main reason, which is, I mean, apart from the standard argument saying that, you know, well, how many people in India really care about privacy? I mean, you know, if fact that 50% of India's population doesn't have access to toilets, what are we talking about? You know, apart from that sort of argument, he makes another one, which is, which is rather, rather uh, unusual. He says that the inaccuracy of the data that is collected uh, is actually something that protects people. For example, he says, up to 20% of government data, databases could be ghosts persons who are registered within the database but who do not actually exist. 
while the obvious effect is inefficiency in the distribution of public services, an unintended consequence is a lack of trust in the database itself. And so, when agencies look to verify identity, they ask for multiple documents to be doubly and triply sure that the person they're dealing with is who he claims he is. This copying strategy made necessary by an inefficient data collection process has curiously enough maintained, has, has protected us from, from uh, data theft. Today, he writes, it is hard to steal identity in India as a thief would need to, enable, uh, to, to obtain not just one, but many pieces of identity information. Aadhaar, therefore, as the most ambitious personal identity project ever attempted anywhere in the world, he says, could well create an infrastructure through which public services will be directed more accurately to their intended recipients, but in the process create a new set of problems. By promising accurate and unique identity, it will also allow us to rely on just one piece of identity information and will strip away the artificial protection that we have relied on all these years, laying us open to identity theft. Um, I just want to conclude this by, by basically saying that, uh, as I was saying, you know, the, the argument that we had was to look at the sets of um, issues that we thought uh, were arising for which there was no easy position to take, where if you like, you know, there was no, regardless of what ideology you, you, you represented, there was no pre-programmed good position. <laughs> You know, uh, you know, against uh, against another one. I think that the kinds of six issues I'm talking about are issues on which clearly there is division, and clearly even the even the ethical extent of the problem is something we uh, have to still work out. So I'll, I'll I'll conclude this here. I'm sorry I've taken a little longer than I should have, but we still have a few minutes for questions, and then obviously over drinks. Thank you. That was a really fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, and, and I apologize if this is not actually the scale at which you work, but I was just totally fascinated. In my, in, um, I, my brain went to other places a lot. But thinking about like the idea of self in, in, the, in the context of technology and the idea of a, of, of a person. There's like an egocentric versus a sociocentric self and, and, and really how technology um, or, or, this or, or registering with the with the government now might be changing ideas of or or how did people articulate maybe changing ideas of self or or what the self is what the person is in the context of of this kind of of, of what it, ecosystem I mean the, the idea of an ecosystem is actually really an interesting concept to kind of think about social change in this in this way and I, I just thought it was it was really fascinating your descriptions. Um, you know. Uh, I, I can just tell you what I think. Um, you know, one of the problems that has arisen with the idea of subjectivity, you know, uh, or, or which, which identity pushes us partly in one direction for, is the assumption that I am a unique being with my own desires, my aspirations, and of course my own secrets. I'm a unique entity. With, with, but uh, if you were to move that away from not asking what I am, uh, but really what is my self-interest? How do I work in a manner that determines my self-interest? It seems to me that we open up a new set of questions that are arising, uh, and, 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 and these sets of questions are very simply these, that if um, the 20th century has seen modern states, uh, and this is something we all grew up with, we know about, seen individuals being converted into identity kits, you might say, you know? I mean, as we, for example, look at here in the United States, this Boston episode, uh, you have a, a particular kind of construction of a person, if you like, you know, that's, that's in place. And that particular idea of constructing a person, an abstract entity that is supposed to be me, that's supposed to look like me, that's supposed to, you know, as, as my uh, other, how, how does that structure work in the digital ecosystem is the first question to ask. So how is my self-interest constructed in the digital ecosystem versus how is a state constructing me in the digital ecosystem? Is it constructing me in a manner that I can own up to and say, okay, that's me? Or is it a particular category that I might want to hide from and say that's not me or I, or I want to protect myself from the way that the state is defining me. The question we had on this then was a rather practical question. It was, 
if you are uh, the tribal woman uh, in Jharkhand, whom we showed in the beginning, or if you are, um, I don't know, an indebted person who has taken huge amounts of microfinance loans in in um, Karnul district in Andhra Pradesh, which is another place where we did a lot of field work in, are you comfortable with negotiating that ecosystem in a manner that allows you to define your self-interest there? That was the question we had. One project that we had, for example, was to do with the Nemadi land um, digitization scheme that we had um, in, 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 in Karnataka, where basically what happened was that um, we went into the gigantic process of digitizing all land records in that particular state, leading to uh, a huge number of straightforward discrepancies between, for example, how the 20th century inaccurately, because obviously, you know, the 20th century not having access to GIS mapping and so on would create only approximate maps. But but people's titles were based on those maps. Now, when you started having discrepancies of that kind, you suddenly found land uh, that people thought they owned being non-existent or huge amounts of land that no one owned and so on and so forth. So you, you ended up with a set of discrepancies, if you like, between the way the digital ecosystem con was constructed as against the earlier one, the earlier physical space that we had. And the question we had was, how, how do you translate a person's idea of self-interest from this reality to that? Those are, that's the directionality in which we wanted to proceed. Uh, I, that, that's the only point I wanted to make, which is that once we start working on the digits of that, then we will not get a utopian mechanism, but we will get, I mean, uh, the, the, the way we would simply put it was that if we had social problems today, we were going to have e-social problems tomorrow. You know, It wasn't going to take away the crises of today. It was simply going to probably translate the present social existent warts and all into a digital domain. Obviously, the two wouldn't map onto each other absolutely. You know, the two, there would be major discrepancies, which then led to the question of how do actually existing people transit into that structure in a manner that keeps their self-interest intact? That was, that was the basic question that we wanted to restrict ourselves to. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, as you went around interviewing all these uh, the so-called beneficiaries, people who are enrolling, yeah. what is their story? Why are they enrolling into this? What is What are they being told, this tribal woman that you showed video? Mm. What is their motivation to get enrolled mm. into this? That's a great question, actually. Um, there is a clear, I mean, you know, we had an interview in Himachal Pradesh, um, which is uh, there somewhere. Uh, where uh, a man has come uh, basically because his wife's name has been misspelled or something. You know, there's a problem. Uh, and he's trying to get that particular problem corrected because her wife's name is it's a very minor issue, but he, he's basically trying to figure out how this will now work. Bang in front of him, uh, and in fact part of the video camera that we have, is a uh, huge Aadhaar poster that says, you will now get your rations through Aadhaar better. So while we were talking to him, he said, look, you know this poster, have you seen this? And do you know that whether this is true or not true? And he said, I don't know. I mean, I haven't a clue. I mean, certainly at this moment, no one's getting the rations through Aadhaar in Himachal. They are actually getting it in pilot projects in, uh, in um, um, I mean, we actually went to Maheshwaram district in Rangareddy, in uh, Maheshwaram Mandal in Rangareddy district near Hyderabad, where they're actually piloting the, the, the um, dispersal of uh, rations on uh, the Aadhaar smart card, but certainly not in, not in Himachal Pradesh. So then when you ask him, why are you here? They will really give the most astonishing reasons. I mean, they will create, and this is a very common thing, a science fiction scenario saying, well, you know, if tomorrow this problem were to occur, uh, if tomorrow I would find myself in this particular place without any money or I'd be accused of a crime I did not commit or this, that or the other would happen to me, then this might be of use. Which is, which is, I mean, it's it's something he has invented. You know, it's not something the state has told him or anything like that. For the for the most, for the, practically, the problem is that people know they need to get it because the state has told them that they should get it. You know, but there is definitely a demand for Aadhaar that considerably exceeds. It's not a little. It's considerably exceeds the demand for, say, voter identity cards. I mean, Indians take their right to vote very seriously. And so you do have a huge number of people who will vote. But this demand for Aadhaar is way larger than that. So I don't know. I mean, I think that one simple thing is that you say, well, there is something desirable about it. And I should be there. I should be, I should be counted. You know, if, I, if I'm not, I'll miss out on something. 
you know it's it's that kind of gray area structure that's arising because there's clearly i mean shankar maruwada who was a very when he worked for aadhar very great supporter of this particular project was actually <laughs> his 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 cards his visiting card said that he was head of demand generation that was the one thing that no one needed because the generation Uh, the the demand being generated was so massive that in fact problems were constantly arising because they didn't have the infrastructure to handle this level and extent of demand why there was this demand i think is a complex question i don't know the answer it is very much a 21st century phenomenon of people not wanting to be left behind as it were but the confusion that people have the the lack of disconnect the the extent of disconnect between what they think they will benefit which is often as i say an imagination and what aadhar is explicitly promising them is huge and and we did put it to uh, the uidi that th- uh, a kind of aspirational demand that is being promised which we, which may not be met could be one of the problems they'll be up against sure so you mentioned the land record system in karnataka yeah uh, so the question i have is did it reduce corruption in that sector and it reduce it equally for the rich and the poor i i mean uh, i i have a little prefatory kind of a disclaimer to make and that is that uh, while the team that i was i mean i was the chief what's it called chief in i think it's called the principal investigator that was my designation so the team was a large one and consisted of a number of people with a number of very distinct skills which i don't necessarily have i may not be the best person to answer some of these questions uh, the land records uh, project was done by zainab bawa and bhuvaneshwari raman raman was earlier involved in a very large project on uh, e governance on investigating e governance in 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 karnataka um basically it seemed that two things had arisen in their basic understanding of nemmadi one is that in opposite well in in con- in um, uh, contravention to the cont- to argument that this was going to actually lead to wider delivery of 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 resources it actually led to a much greater degree of centralization because they have this phrase called street bureaucrats that is basically Uh, it's a phrase that i came across only for the first time in their work they basically the people who who a villager will be directly in touch with the person who comes to their house the person to whom they have access the guy in the village you know who who represents them was a category that had virtually disappeared with digitization which meant that it was actually moving in karnataka into bangalore this led to not necessarily corruption but two sets of problems one the kind of data around property that was uh, disputed you know so so i would for example say well i own this property but your data says he owns it so i have a dispute how do i resolve that dispute a or b ambiguous property or c the kind of clear title property that existed suddenly getting a much larger market valuation because it was seen to be clear title all of this led they said not necessarily to corruption but certainly to a a, a new broker mechanism or intermediary you know brokers who would then be hired to solve the problem for you so that problem didn't go away so you know you that that's that's for us an interesting problem because it arises from you know an earlier set of problems but creates a new set of problems if you like with a new set of managers for those particular problems right the main problem who sure. are these new brokers what they um i could send you that essay and it, it is a rather complicated essay on that particular question i understand that it's basically um very often either a set of uh, uh i mean an earlier set of brokers who acquired new skills you know the kind of people who mediated on land issues or basically people who seemed to um know how it was done you know how how the the wrong incorrect data from the point of view of one of the each either side of the dispute uh, you know could could be corrected to solve that so it was people who knew someone or it could be people who said well i'll 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 tell you how it is done you know it's like for example you have the rtos you know when you you know you you have to hire someone to fill in your forms just so that the person be able to handhold you through that particular process Thanks Ashisha this is um I mean you've opened up this kind of world uh but it's um you know a pandora's box of of 
problems. And I guess one kind of very general question I have is, given all of the time, the massive team, the collation of data that's allowed you to present this set of critiques of Aadhaar, mm. in a way, the kind of the big question I'm wondering is, is your critique, whether you want to speak personally or kind of for the group, with Aadhaar per se, or is it, um, in a sense, more uh, that, that it highlights a broader set of structural problems that we see repeatedly in the Indian, you know, in, in, in Indian in governance, mm -hmm. right? So in a way, I mean, I guess I, I, partly my question is coming from the seed somewhere is that um, living in the United States, you can't function without a social security number, yes. right? Part of what makes me uncomfortable about Aadhaar is not the notion of that identity number, because I've lived with that all my life and functioned with that. Okay. Partly for me, the problem, there's a concern around the kind of the, the iris scan and, and the, the telemetrics of it is somehow troubling. But, but that leads me to wonder, is the problem with Aadhaar or is the problem really with all of these other things for which there are no answers. Does that, does that make sense as a question? Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, and, and I don't have answers to it either. And, and indeed, you know, one of the problems that we did have uh, was, uh, you know, I mean, I think when we made a presentation to Nilekani himself, he said, so what then, what, what are your key conclusions? <laughs> you know, so what? And we didn't have any key conclusions. We were basically opening up a space. We wanted to actually open up debate. And that was the, the Ford Foundation had also required us to do that, to actually open up the the space that we have, because from that could potentially emerge the kinds of criteria by which they could they could understand uh, the, the the situation. I think two things. One is that, as I was saying earlier, I think the other is a cog in a la larger wheel. So other is not the big picture, and we wanted the big picture. We didn't want to restrict ourselves to other. However, as a part of a larger whole, Aadhaar was certainly useful in that it had given us a picture of the larger whole that no other uh, state beneficiary, state benefit pro project had done. They took it upon themselves to market Aadhaar to a number of agencies saying what Aadhaar could do for PDS, what Aadhaar could do for Narega, what Aadhaar could do for health, what Aadhaar could do for insurance, etc., etc. You know, basically saying that if you were the 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 RSBY or if you were this particular man, if you took on Aadhaar, you could do this particular set of. Um, that was a crucial, that was a key uh, structure. For the most part, it seemed that they were basically saying that you can just do what you're doing better. But more than that, uh, there were specific scale up, scalable, scalable opportunities that they were arguing for. These are a set of position papers which are available, they're on their website. Uh, and they're extremely interesting because this is the first time that you have uh, that kind of agency actually, you might say, commissioning social scientists to write up papers on what uh, Aadhaar could now do for, 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 for the program. I think that, I think that uh, yes, a, you're right. I mean, it, it, it does make for that benefit argument uh, fairly straightforwardly. But B, it, it definitely, as I was saying, deviates from an earlier state structure right. by leveraging what came to be known in, in the, in the mid-90s, and Nilekan is a key part of it, as public-private partnerships. So it was sort of setting up these kinds of potential arrangements, you know, and saying that it could facilitate those arrangements. And, and this is how Nilikani also talked about it in his in his book. Yeah, yeah. sure. Thanks. I to the I'm puzzled by your idea of an ecosystem, which you even seemed to challenge when you started to speak about vernacular mm -hmm. digitals. And this may not be the same all over the whole country and that digitization may be received differently in different regions or I assume with different segments of the population. Uh, so th that's one aspect of it. But the other thing, I'd like some specific uh, examples. Okay, Aadhaar's creating a database. Do you have examples where the Aadhaar database is linked to any other database or whether it's just a case that a bank or the ration system, or any other of these systems, wants a person's Aadhaar number. Uh, I thought it was national policy that 
the census would not be linked to Adar. There was discussion when they were going to collect the SECC data whether Adar would be, the Adar employees would be used mm -hmm. to do that. They denied that. They, they, mm -hmm. I thought there was a, you know, an, an almost, you know, a, a wall between Adar and the census. So I'm wondering where the Adar database is linked to any other database. Yeah. And given that, I mean, if, if, is it? Yes, uh, it is. Um, to which ones? Basically, in, in different states, different databases. Um, the, oh. the, so that's again a challenge to the ecosystem. Though, yes, so. yes, that's right. That's 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 close to the point I'm making. Well, uh, just to okay, just to explain just to yeah. explain the, the way it works. Mm -hmm. What happens is that um, in any state government, uh, um, the uh, UIDAI signs an MOU with that particular state government, right? As a part of that MOU that they sign with the state government, the state government nominates a registrar. Now, importantly, it is not unique. So the UIDAI can sign another MOU with another potential registrar. But state governments normally nominate a, stand, a, 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 a centralized registrar who is going to be the agency in that state. OK, point one. Having done that, the, 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 the registrar then looks around and says, what are the kinds of local schemes in that state that they will mount on Aadhaar? OK, having done that, what they do is that they put together a questionnaire, right, which is known as the KYR plus. So KYR, know your resident, is the core structure that Aadhaar needs. And that's fairly lean and mean. It's actually fairly basic. But then there's a KYR plus structure, which the state government adds on to Aadhaar, where they then ask for a huge number of additional in data, which they can put together as per their preferences and requirements. They do that mostly because they're trying to look at the kinds of benefits they want to link to Aadhaar. Right? Uh, in the case of, for example, uh, Karnataka, uh, it has been linked to gas connections. You know, uh, the the national pop, the the what's it called, uh, LPG. The the what, what does LPG stand for? <laughs> Liquid petroleum gas. <laughs> LPG cylinders, for example, are not given unless you have an Aadhaar card. In the case of Andhra, they uh, basically have. My, my question yeah, is, yeah. So you have a register of people who are eligible for cylinders. Yeah. That's one database. Yeah. It's using the Aadhaar number. Yeah. But it's not linked to another database that also uses the Aadhaar number. Well, that's the question. Is it? So there is actually something like an API, an application program interface. Right. Basically, something that you can use with that API. Right, right. Right. No, so it's a, that's what, that's what, that, that was my understanding too. But the gas company can't look up somebody's medical record. No, the, no, so, that's true. And in fact, the census, the, you know, nobody can look up the census records other than the census. Even well, the state government. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that's, I'm, so this notion that somehow digitization is having some kind of uniform effect. No, it's not. A that's sing, single digital subject. When we, when we basically have a proliferation of kind of hmm. plural systems, which is very similar in some sense. It has nothing to do with, you know, digitization per se. It's very similar to the way the social security number has been used in the United States since it was instituted. You want to apply to university, you got to give them a number. In your bank account, you got to give them a number. Hmm. Your uh, health insurance, you got to give them a number. Your driver's license, I mean, it's, but these are not a single, e I mean, this, so what, what does it mean to, so to well, I don't know what that means is my question. I mean, and, and the point that there's something significant that all of a sudden, you know, these, we have this electronic kind of surveillance over it where in fact, you know, I don't know how different it is when it was all paper. It could make it easier, but I mean, that's what I'd like to hear, hear more about because I, I know in certain of these areas they've, they've been erecting See, the, the, uh, the question, I mean, you know, uh, let's, let's, let's go on it step by step, right? Uh, let's not sort of uh, go into surveillance all of a sudden. Um, interoperability is a problem. Aadhaar is expected to solve that problem as best as it can. To take continue the Andhra Pradesh instance, you have a long history in the state of Andhra Pradesh where they actually have biometric data. Okay, That goes back to a long time. They've, they've been collecting fingerprints and iris scans for a period of time. 
that's one data. They are updating that database. So what they're using is that the, the, the process of Aadhaar inherits that particular database and adds to it and modifies it. On the other hand, you have another database quite autonomously, which is run by Narega. One of the challenges that they have is to get the two databases to talk to each other. Okay? It means that when you have a particular person, that person will link on the one side to the PDS and on the other side to Narega. So interoperability is a really big issue that Aadhaar is expected to solve and different state governments are looking at various kinds of structures. So yes, I think there is that situation where different sorts of databases are able to talk to each other in relation to how they find the central node in a particular person, but it's going to be something that happens over time. Is this surveillance, can this lead to surveillance or not? I think it's just too early to tell. And I don't think that the last word has been said on the subject by any means. I think that there is a definite ambition, in particular with, with what we would uh, call the Chidambaram imagination, to see it as something that would create this. But if it happens, it'll happen only over time. Um, right now, the problem basically is you know, as I was saying, different state governments having very different sorts of ambitions for, for it. And that is the kind of level at which one would want to restrict the ecosystem in precisely in, con in, in contrast to the, the sort of national hyper-centralized imagination. But I do want to say in my last point uh, is that something like the, the uh, Electronic uh, Delivery of Services Act uh, which was which which was not passed. Uh, it was only still talks about this kind of centralized structure, and the NEGP uh, also st does speak about this the centralized structure. It's it's part of the imagination. Practically, we'll see what happens. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.